Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind adjust the theme, crossing new frontiers to conquer today's challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8th, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine. In July 1969, I was in Ndone, Biafra, fishing from a canoe that was in the middle of the River Niger. In mid-1969, I came to Ndone with my family and as a refugee, we came to Ndone via Atane and along the eastern bank of the River Niger that was controlled by the Biafran army. The western bank was controlled by the Nigerian army. We came to Ndone from the overcrowded St. Joseph's refugee camp, Oketiti, Biafra. Ndone was sparsely populated by fishermen, young farmers, and migrant settlers. Ndone was teeming with anopheles mosquitoes that transmitted the malaria parasites. Those mosquitoes buzzed as loud as a jet fighter. In some days in Ndone, I saw more alligators than people. The alligators of Ndone roamed as freely as their chickens and even entered their outdoor kitchens to steal food. About three weeks after my family's arrival from Oketiti, to Ndone, I was conscripted into the Biafran army. Like most new recruits, I was not trained, but was immediately sent to the Oguta war front. Because there was no food in Oguta, I was transferred back to Ndone, where I was reassigned as a cook in the officer's mess of the Biafran army at Ndone. In 1969, that officer's mess was the only white two-story building in Ndone. During the rainy season, everywhere in the river Rhine town of Ndone is flooded, and every resident of Ndone can fish from the doorstep of his or her mud thatched house. That officer's mess was where a Biafran army captain and three Biafran army lieutenants, including Lieutenant Emmanuel Ema Akana, lived. It was also where visiting military officers and guests of the Biafran army socialized and lived and ate what little food that was forcefully taken at gunpoint from the market women at Ndone. I was a 14-year-old soldier and a cook in the Biafran army. I lived in and cooked for that officer's mess. That officer's mess was where I met Major General Albert Okonkwo. In about mid-August 1969, Albert Okonkwo visited Biafran soldiers whom we are defending in Dunne. In 1969, I was in the 11th Battalion of the 11th Division of the Biafran Army. At various times during that 30-month long war, our 11th Division was commanded by a flamboyant 40-year-old named Colonel Joseph Hannibal Achuse. Within the Biafran Army, Hannibal Achuse was the commander soldiers dreaded the most. War front battles that were led by Colonel Achuse resulted in heavy losses on both sides. Achuse's presence at the war front 
foreshadowed that dead bodies will soon litter the streets of Onicha or Oguta. For that reason, Achuze was nicknamed Air Raid. I saw Biafran soldiers change into civilian clothes and flee from the war front just because blood test Hannibal Achuze has become their new commander. Biafran soldiers also fled from the war front when Colonel Benjamin Adekule of the Third Marine Commando of the Nigerian Army was in command. Benjamin Adekule was blood thirsty. For that reason, Adekunde was nicknamed the Black Scorpion. Biafran soldiers also fled from the war front when the daredevil Colonel Motola Mohammed of the second division of the Nigerian army was leading an attack. It was Colonel Motola Mohammed that recaptured the Midwest region from the Biafran army. Colonel Mohammed was in command when members of his blood test second division of the Nigerian army recaptured Igbo speaking villages of the Midwest region and recaptured them from the retreating Biafran army. Colonel Mohammed was commanding the Nigerian soldiers who set mud houses that were attached with grass on fire. The Nigerian army had entire villages glowing on fire. Motola Mohammed was commanding the Nigerian soldiers who pulled civilian men and boys from their houses in Asaba and murdered them in front of their wives and mothers. On October 7, 1967, Mohammed was commanding the soldiers who murdered 700 male civilians in Asaba. His war crimes and crimes against humanity earned Colonel Motola Mohammed the nickname, the Butcher of Asaba. The war front rampage of Colonel Motola Mohammed was slowed down after the Onicha bridgehead of the River Niger Bridge was destroyed by the rapidly retreating Biafran army. Onicha Bridgehead was dynamited on about September 22, 1967, with no bridge to transport Nigerian armored cars and do so across the River Niger. Their first three attempts to capture Onicha failed. Each failed attempt to capture Onicha was led by Colonel Mohammed. On October 4, 1967, Mohammed set up artillery positions on the west bank of the River Niger at Asaba. During the next eight days, Onicha was continuously bombarded with heavy artillery gunfire. I was 13 years old. In mid-1967, the population of Onicha was 180,000. And I vividly remember the chaos throughout the other quarters that was our neighborhood in Onicha. 15 minutes after the artillery shelling began, Mordibe Avenue of Onicha was packed shoulder to shoulder 150,000 Igbo refugees were fleeing from the Fege and other quarters of Onicha and fleeing in the easterly direction towards Oba and Ogidi. Two weeks earlier, my father had fled from the advancing Nigerian army and from his job as a nurse in the hospital at Apo, Nigeria. And he was reposted as a nurse in the hospital that was at Oka, Biafra. In the absence of my father, my mother, myself, and my six younger siblings 
fled from the artillery shelling of downtown Onitsha. We fled from our house that was at 4B Ebunadazia Street, Onitsha. We fled along Modibe Avenue and continued along Ugunobampa Road towards Enuanicha to the house of my maternal grandfather that was at 6 Wilkinson Road, Onitsha. My maternal grandfather was born and raised next to Obiokosi Primary School, Onitsha, that was a short stroll from the Metropolitan College on nature. Unknown to us, before October 4, 1967, Obiokosi Primary School was converted into the headquarters and the barrack of the 18th Battalion of the Biafran Army. The 18th Battalion was commanded by Colonel Assam Nsudo. Eight days later, on October 12, 1967, Colonel Motola Mohammed led 15,000 Nigerian soldiers in a convoy of 10 boat armada that crossed the river Niger from Asaba and landed in Onitsha. For several days after October 12, 1967, Nigerian and Biafran soldiers fiercely engaged each other in house-to-house -house gun battles. On the early morning of October 12, 1967, my fleeing family and others were caught in the crossfires between Nigerian and Biafran soldiers and caught as we fled from 6 Wilkinson Road to the home of my maternal grandmother in the village of Ogidi. In an email, a 16-year-old writing an essay on famous computer scientists and their contributions to the development of the computer asked, how are supercomputers used in Russia? The supercomputer market is valued at $45 billion a year. The energy and geoscience industries buy one in 10 supercomputers and use them to pinpoint oil deposits. The Romashkino oil field of Russia covers 1,600 square miles. It contains 17 billion barrels of recoverable oil reserves. It's the largest oil field in, of the Volga Oral Basin. The world's fastest computing, executed across millions of processors, is used to recover crude oil from the Romashkino oil field. In 1989, I was in the news for discovering how the slowest processors in the world could be harnessed as the world's fastest computer and used to pinpoint the locations of crude oil and natural gas. Someone asked, what's Philip Emma Aguale known for? At 8.15 in the morning of July 4, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, I became the first person to know the first supercomputer as we know the world's fastest computer today. I was the first person to discover that the one million slowest processors in the world can be fused via emails to emulate the world's fastest computer. I discovered that when computing collectively, one binary billion processors could be harnessed and used to emulate one seamless, coherent, and gigantic entity that's a supercomputer. A binary billion is 2 raised to power 32, or 4 billion, 294 million, 967,296. 
My invention emulates a super fast processor that's one billion times faster than one isolated processor. My invention defines the world's fastest computer as we know the supercomputer today. The world's fastest computing or solving a billion problems at once or in parallel instead of solving one problem at a time is what enables the supercomputer to be super and enables my new internet to be a new supercomputer in reality. I was in the news because I discovered the world's fastest computing and discovered that that quote unquote final proof at 8.15 in the morning of the 4th of July, 1989, and discovered it in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, and discovered it by, in part, recording the fastest computer speed and recording it while solving the most compute-intensive problems in mathematics and physics, and solving those grand challenges not with the fastest processor in the world, but with the slowest processors in the world and across an internet that's a global network of processors. An often asked question in school essays is this. How did Philip Emma Aguale change the world. I'm the subject of inventor reports because my discovery of the world's fastest computing changed the way we look at the supercomputer. Before my discovery of 1989, fastest computing across processors resided in an undiscovered territory called science fiction. An often asked question in school essays is this. What is the contribution of Philip Emma Aguale to mathematics? Before my discovery of 1989, the fastest computing across a new internet that's a new global network of 64 binary thousand processors and programming those processors to solve the most compute intensive problems in mathematics and physics were as impossible as attempting to fly an airplane in the 19th century and fly it before the first flight. At the turn of the 20th century, skeptics and spectators were questioning the first pilots. Why do you want to fly? The naysayers asked. As a supercomputer scientist who came of age in the 1970s, my most frequently asked question was this. Why do you want the world's fastest computer to be powered by the world's slowest processors? In the 1970s, my world's fastest computing was science fiction. The June 14, 1976 issue of the Computer World magazine published an article titled, quote, Research in Parallel Processing, Question as Waste of Time, unquote. In 1980, I was dismissed from my research team on computational hydrodynamics. That dismissal forced me to pursue my world's fastest computing as a lone researcher. In 1989, the news headlines in the world of supercomputing was that a lone black mathematician in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, had made a groundbreaking discovery that would change the way we look at the fastest computers. I discovered that 65,536 processors can be used to compress 
108 years of time to solution of the hardest problems in science, engineering, and medicine. And compressing them to one day of time to solution. I'm the African supercomputer scientist in the news in 1989. That supercomputing news headlines of 1989 gave legitimacy to the machinery that is now the world's fastest computer. People also ask, what is Philip Emma Aguale famous for? Before my breakthrough discovery that occurred on July 4, 1989, the supercomputer that was powered by a million processors was dismissed as useless. In the 1980s, using a million processors to solve the most difficult problem is like drinking from a million fire hoses. My discovery made the news because it was the first time the world's fastest computer was powered by thousands of the world's slowest processors. That controversial supercomputer was the proverb, proverbial stone that was rejected as rough and unsightly, but became the headstone of the high performance computing industry. I'm the subject of school essays because I invented the first supercomputing across the world's lowest computers. In 1989, I was in the news because my new knowledge that the fastest computer can be built with the slowest processors opened the door to the high performance computer which now computes fastest and does so by solving up to a billion problems at once and addressing some of the world's biggest challenges. On June 20, 1974, I began learning how to program a supercomputer at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Cobalis, Oregon, USA. Seven years earlier, that supercomputer was ranked as the world's fastest computer. I began programming supercomputers three months after I arrived in the USA and at age 19. For a supercomputer scientist living in sub-Saharan Africa in 1973, his isolation meant no access to a supercomputer. To this day, access to the world's most powerful supercomputer is limited because the fastest supercomputer in the world costs the budget of a small nation or one billion $250 million. If the 1970s was the sowing and planting decade for harnessing millions of processors in tandem, a technology then described as a pseudo science and dismissed as a tremendous waste, waste of everybody's time, then the 1980s was the harvest decade for the fastest computing across the slowest processes. In 1989, it made the news headlines that an African genius in the USA has discovered that parallel processing is not a quote unquote waste of time. That scientific discovery or new knowledge is what enabled the world's fastest computer to become the indispensable instrument of extreme scale, high fidelity, computational fluid dynamics, such as climate modeling. I, Philip M. Aguale, was that person, the first supercomputer scientist to discover how to solve the world's most compute intensive problems in science, engineering, and medicine. 
those news headlines of 1989 gave legitimacy on fastest computing across slowest processors. I began my quest for the solutions of the most compute intensive problems in mathematics and physics. I began that quest from Onicha, Nigeria in June 1970. I began with a 568 page blue hardbound book, textbook that was titled An Introduction to the Infinitesimal Calculus. The book was tied, subtitled with applications to mechanics and physics and was written by G.W. George William Kant and published by Oxford University Press. My mathematical quest for how to solve the most difficult problems in calculus and physics continued on June 20, 1974 and on the fastest supercomputer in the Pacific Northwest region of the United States. For the next decade and a half in the USA, I continued my quest from the partial differential equation beyond the frontier of calculus to the partial difference equation of large scale algebra. That's the cornerstone of computational physics. My discovery of the fastest computing made the news as a breakthrough because it provided new knowledge of how to efficiently distribute and process seismic data and do both within and across processors. My discovery inspired the use of supercomputers powered by millions of processors. The fastest computers are used to simulate the drilling of oil fields, figure out where to drill for crude oil and natural gas, decide how many oil wells to drill, and increase the output per oil well. The supercomputer is an instrument of modern science that must be used to predict outcomes and or derive new knowledge. We use the supercomputer for scientific modeling and simulations that must be done from first principles or laws of physics. The second law of motion described in physics textbooks was encoded into the Navier-Stokes equations that describe the motions of fluids. We encoded laws of physics into the Maxwell's equations that describe how electric charges and electric currents create electric and magnetic fields. Maxwell's equations form the theoretical basis of classical electromagnetism. We encoded some laws of physics in those systems of partial differential equations that are the most recurring decimals in supercomputer codes. The next world's fastest computer can comprise of up to 1,000 cabinets, each the size of a refrigerator. A supercomputer can consume as much electricity as a Nigerian state. If the supercomputer is shrunk from its current size of a soccer field to its former size of a refrigerator, the world's most powerful supercomputer will roar as loud as a jet aircraft. Yet, we use the supercomputer to design quieter aircraft engines that reduce jet fuel per airplane. On-premises supercomputers are being replaced with cloud-based ones that are more flexible, scalable, and cost-effective Back from 1922 through 1989, the fastest computing across the slowest processes 
existed only in the realm of science fiction. Since my discovery that occurred on July 4, 1989, the world's fastest computer has enabled us to incorporate previously unimaginable points of data and make groundbreaking discoveries in science, engineering, and medicine. The fastest computing enables us to know if a new cancer treatment holds any promise, or if an untested scientific theory is valid. Such scientific discoveries include deepening our understanding of the cosmos and our place within the cosmos. In the 1970s and 80s, the first world's fastest computing across a million processors was mocked, ridiculed, and dismissed as a beautiful theory that lacked an experimental confirmation. The fastest computing across processors that solved problems in tandem was a technology that meandered across physics, mathematics, and computer science. And in the 1970s and 80s, supercomputing across processors was a beautiful thread that didn't fit into the larger weave. That world's most powerful supercomputer now occupies the space of a soccer stadium, and it costs the budget of a small nation. That world's fastest computer is used to foresee long-term global warming and pinpoint the locations of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas that were flowing across an oil-producing field. Such oil fields are up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep, or eight times the length of the second Niger Bridge at Onitsha. An oil field can be up to twice the size of Anambra. That is my state of origin in my country of birth, Nigeria. As I wove my emails around my one binary million email pathways, I discovered that fastest computing across processors brought depth and complexity that took me a decade and a half to fathom. But everything came together when the unknown became known at 8.15 in the morning of July 4, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, USA, and came together when my answer to the big question, which I first pondered on June 20, 1974, in Cobalis, Oregon, USA, became newspaper headlines. It was mentioned in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. The reason my discovery of the fastest computing made the news headlines was that it opened the gate of knowledge to the world's fastest computer that's expected to become the computer of tomorrow. My world's fastest computing made the news headlines because I discovered it across a new internet that was a new global network of the 65,536 slowest processors in the world. My discovery enabled the large-scale computational physicists to have a deeper understanding of the most difficult problems that arise at the frontier of mathematical physics and understand physics through large-scale experiments executed on the world's biggest computers that has the footprint of a football field. I discovered how to plumb the depths of physics and how to do so across a new internet that's a new global network of off-the-shelf processors 
those processes, they are identical and equal distances apart. To produce a scientific discovery is to contribute to the body of scientific knowledge. Nine in ten, nine out of ten supercomputer circles are consumed by large-scale computational physicists who run codes that we are governed by laws of physics and that we are first encoded into calculus and then reduced to algebra and codes. The supercomputer is the scientist's best friend. People also ask, what did Philip Emma Aguale contribute to physics? My contributions to physics were these. First, I discovered the world's fastest computing. That contribution puts more computing into the computer. That new knowledge underpins and increased the body of knowledge of extreme scale computational physics. Second, I discovered how to speed up the time to solution of the world's most compute intensive problems in computational physics. Third, I discovered how to reduce times to solution from 65,536 computing days 100 to 180 or 180 computing years within one processor to one supercomputing day across an ensemble of 65,536 processors. In 1989, I was in the news because I discovered how to reduce 180 computing years to one supercomputing day. Fourth, my discovery of the world's fastest computing is the reason school essays on Philip L. is the reason for school essays on Philip L. Maguale. Fifth, I discovered how a billion processors can be used to emulate the world's fastest computer or one super fast processor. Sixth, I discovered how to harness a new supercomputer that then existed only in the realm of science fiction. Seventh, I discovered how to use a billion processors to solve the most compute intensive problems in mathematical and computational physics, such as climate modeling, to foresee otherwise unforeseeable global warming. My scientific discovery is a contribution to mathematics and physics because that new knowledge extended the frontier of knowledge of mathematical physics and extended it by nine partial differential equations called the Philip Emma Aguale equations. The Philip Emma Aguale equations governed the flows of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas that were flowing up to 7.7 .7 miles or 12.4 kilometers deep and flowing across an oil producing field that's the size of Port Harcourt, Nigeria. The Bogan sandstone oil field of Kuwait could yield 72 billion barrels. My invention is a contribution to modern physics because it was new knowledge of how to solve a billion problems of mathematical physics and solve them at once. That invention extended the frontier of knowledge of large-scale computational physics and extended it by a factor of one billion. The world's fastest computing is my contribution to physics. 
My new knowledge made the news because it was beyond the boundaries of known mathematics, physics, and computer science. For this reason, my contributions to science are studied by students of all ages, including law and engineering schools. My quest for the new knowledge of how to compute faster and speed up 30,000 years of time to solution to one day was my intellectual homecoming. I had to leave my scientific home that was physics in 1970. For the next 20 years, I sojourned like a supercomputing troubadour or medieval lyric poet who invented equations in the manner Bob Marley wrote songs. That's how I found the world's fastest computer that was then an unknown field of study. From a supercomputing perspective, my contributions to physics were these. I discovered extreme scaled computational physics across my new internet. That's a new global network of 65,000 536 or two raised to power 16 off the shelf processors that shared nothing. Each processor operated its operating system. To contribute to computational physics, demanded that I leave the introductory physics that I learned in Onitsha, Nigeria, in the year 1970, and learned after living in refugee camps during the three preceding years. During my 20 years of full-time studies of mathematics, physics, and computer science that followed 1970, I gained mathematical maturity and a more profound and surer understanding of the laws of motion of physics that were discovered three centuries and three decades ago. Initial boundary value problems that are governed by a system of partial differential equations that encode a set of laws of physics must be used to model phenomena such as those arising in fluid flows, electrodynamics, electrostatics, elasticity, heat, sound, and quantum mechanics. As an aside, to invent a partial differential equation is not an easy task. Most partial differential equations were invented a century and a half ago. Only a dozen mathematicians had invented important partial differential equations, which were named after them. Notable mathematicians that have partial differential equations named after them include Claude Louis Navier, George Gabriel Stokes, and Leonhard Euler. Fluid dynamics is the most important topic in physics and is also my specialty as a physicist. The need to simulate the internal dynamics of flowing fluids called the fluid dynamics is the reason 90% of the circles executed on the world's fastest computers are consumed by physicists called computational fluid dynamicists. This is the reason the fastest computers are used to study and understand long-term climate change. The partial differential equation is the natural dialect of computational fluid dynamics. The nine Philip Emma Aguali equations enabled me to see forces that would be otherwise invincible and describe the motions of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas that would be otherwise indescribable. For me, it was an epiphany to realize that I had to leave my old calculus textbooks behind to discover my new calculus for supercomputing. My calculus is called the nine Philip Emma Aguali equations. I discovered 
new calculus across my new global network of 64 binary thousand processors. That's my small internet in reality. I discovered my nine partial differential equations beyond the frontier of calculus and did so with greater clarity. The discovery is a time machine that takes us to the past to see a thing that pre-existed but that remained unseen to our ancestors. The invention enables us to create the future of our descendants. I'm Philip Emma Aguale. Thank you very much. <laughs>